So after posting my last video about the uh, five point safety check on my ShopSmith Mark V, I actually had comments from people about me being overly concerned about safety. Well, let me tell you a little something about personal safety. You know, in 1963, I was born with all 10 of these, and over the years, I've grown quite attached to them. And as a result, I look for ways to do all of my hobbies as safely as possible. So in this video, we're going to talk about the five-piece safety kit that ShopSmith has been including with their ShopSmith Mark V and Mark VII since about the mid-80s, and make sure that we all know exactly how they are used. So back in the early 1980s, ShopSmith purchased a company from McGraw Edison that was making a line of tools called Benchmark and also Shopcraft. And uh, those tools were little bench top power tools. There was a three-wheeled bandsaw, a lathe, a sander, a few other tools. And uh, they thought that, number one, those tools were maybe a little bit of a competition for the ShopSmith line, but also might even serve as an entry-level line of tools for people that might ultimately become interested in ShopSmith equipment. So uh, along with that purchase uh, came a couple engineers, uh, Jack Legler and um, was it Bob? Um, I'll remember Bob Berkeley, I think. And uh, these are guys that I work with in ShopSmith back when I was with the company back in the, uh, the late 80s and, and 90s. And uh, they had already had a couple products in the works that after that purchase, ShopSmith was able to patent. And those other tools are things that are right in front of me here. Uh, one of them being this featherboard, this push stick, a variation of this thing called a fence straddler. This is the most recent version that fits on the 520 fence, 520 model of the ShopSmith Mark V. And then also the, uh, the push block. Now, when these were first introduced, they all said ShopSmith on them and they were all gray. So you may find one in your uh, stash that says ShopSmith has a logo there. And then uh, as the patent was then uh, given to them, they decided to go ahead and uh, market these under another brand that they owned which is, you may be able to see that there, Edgewood. So the red tools say Edgewood. Some of them have their patent numbers on them. Yep, this one has a patent number right there. And uh, interesting story about this. Um, they, they created these tools, and then after being on the market a couple years, we started seeing knockoffs, particularly of the push stick and the featherboard, because these were just fantastic. They, they just work so well. And I remember they're having uh, some meetings to discuss, well, what do we do? And uh, they decided that they really didn't want to enforce the patent because they are safety related. Um, they would just go ahead and let people knock the tools off. That was quite a debate because the knockoffs had no idea how these were designed to be made and of what material. And uh, one of the things, for example, is the, uh, the plastic that they use for the push stick is designed to turn to powder if it contacts the blade. And uh, who knows if you make that out of melted uh, milk jugs or something, it may not have the, those properties. Um, these all came with this Mark V that I purchased used. And um, prior to this, my Mark V was the Model 510, which has a narrower fence. In fact, here is the fence straddler from the 510 model. It also fits the original Mark V Model 500. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about how each of these tools are used. Um, let's, let's start with acknowledging that almost all of these, or, or really all of them, were designed for use with a table saw. Yeah, you can use the push block on your jointer. Um, you can use these in any, any uh, operation that you feel like maybe your hands are getting too close to a blade or to abrasive or something. But really, they were designed to support sawing. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. If you have enough room between the fence and the blade for your hand, right? If there's enough room here on the board to push the stock through, you have enough room for a push block. And the non-slip surface on the bottom of this push block, it, it has more non-slip surface than your hand. And if this encounters a splinter or a blade, 
it's not going to be a problem. Now, I mentioned that because take a look at this. Again, this is one that I purchased that has been in a little bit of a fight. Imagine if that were somebody's hand. So uh, they, they have a slight angle to the handle. So depending upon where you're standing, that angle should continue the angle of your hand or, or your arm so that if you're pushing towards the fence, it continues to apply pressure towards the fence. We need to do a video on ripping at some point, but uh, it is important to be on the same side of the fence as your wood, but standing away from the wood in case you would encounter a kickback. You can be a witness of the wood flying by and not a victim. Um, so let's say that we have our fence close enough to this that uh, I'm uncomfortable with that and I'm going to want to use my push stick. And let's just uh, move this camera down a bit so you can see this. Um, we're going to go ahead and put the feather board on. In fact, let me unplug this and we will take off the saw guard. And yes, I use my guards and I love them. So I would uh, set my blade height to about a quarter inch above the wood. Really the, the goal is to have the carbide tooth at the top to be above the wood, about that height. And then uh, using the feather board, with this board touching the blade, that's as far forward as I want this feather board to be. If I put it any further forward, it's going to take the cut piece and push it right against the side of the blade. So I don't want that. That's going to go right here, put a little bit of pressure against it, and then tighten the knobs. Okay? And then <clears throat> I typically will take the push stick, and this is going to seem weird. I'm just going to admit it. I stick it under my arm with the handle facing forward because I don't want the push stick way out here. That's crazy talk. I don't need the push stick until I'm up on the table making the cut. So the push stick goes here. I begin to make the cut. After the board is up on the table, I don't stop pushing the board forward. I continue to push the board forward as I reach for the push stick and push it on through. Now again, this was not my push stick. But that has also come into contact with the blade at some point. So again, I'm assuming that that, uh, that saved somebody's finger right there. Okay, you could put it here, you could put it here. Um, with vibrations of the table, you never know where those are going to wind up. So I always just tuck it underneath my arm to make the cut. If I'm using a push block, I might start the cut with the push block right there. And then when I'm uh, up on the table and getting close to the blade, the dado, whatever, I would apply pressure with the push block and push it all the way through the saw. All right, so this is where we get into uh, the need for the fence straddler. If we are very, very close to the blade with the fence, and really this is designed to still be used with the guard, so we're, we're talking about uh, a rip of about three quarters of an inch or so wide with the guard in place. You can see that there is just room for the fence straddler to squeeze by. You can't see that at all, can you? Just enough room for the fence straddler to squeeze its way through. Um, so that's about as close as we're going to use the fence straddler for making cuts. So now I've got this feather board as far back as it can go, and it's, uh, it's not far enough back to let me use the featherboard. So that means I'm actually safe using my hands for this. To set the fence straddler up, you loosen the knob on it and you, you raise this up so that when that's sitting firmly on top of the fence, it's adjusted down so that it's touching the top of the board. And this is kind of weird to do as I'm doing here. And it's got a little bit of a finger or a pushing prop right there. And then I will start my cut with a fence straddler in place, but riding up on top of the board. And I make my cut, and then as it gets to the point where I need to start pushing with the fence straddler, it'll drop in place. And that is the sign to me to push that on through. They did change this, and uh, they used an off-the-shelf bolt here and it doesn't quite work as well as the original design. You see the 510 model, it has a hex shaped uh, bolt head and that slides 
very nicely if you, uh, if you wax these. The one I have in my shop is waxed. By the way, this is my garage. Um, I have a shop that I, 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 I use, but it's, uh, it's also quite a ways from here. So I'm starting to set some tools up at home so I can get some things done here. All right, two more bonus things I wanted to show you. You know, I mentioned that uh, the featherboard was getting knocked off. Um, here is a featherboard I purchased from Harbor Freight this weekend. And you say, well, that's, that's quite different than the Shopsmith one. In fact, it's got, uh, it's got a protractor built into it of some sort. It's got a, it's got a, uh, a magnet on it. Well, it's not going to hold on to that. It's got a magnet that would hold on to something, not an aluminum shopsmith table or an aluminum fence. Um, but I want to hold this up against the shopsmith featherboard, and maybe you can see where this featherboard got its inspiration. I mean, it is almost a perfect match for that. And uh, that was one of the ones that was a knockoff. This will fit a shopsmith slot. It'll also fit a standard three-quarter inch wide table slot. So if you don't have a Mark V, or if you uh, if you do and you, you don't have a featherboard, uh, go ahead and pick one of those up at Harbor Freight. They're very inexpensive, and uh, it would it would perform in a similar fashion to the Shopsmith featherboard. If only that one would tighten. Come on now. One of the things they did, that uh, they went on the cheap on this. The Shopsmith Featherboard has a proprietary bolt that they're using. And you can see the head of that bolt is a bugle shape and it has two little fins on it. And that's designed to lock into that uh, bar that's spreading in the miter slot. And it doesn't rotate. So as I'm turning the knob, that thing, all it does is spread. It doesn't, uh, doesn't rotate. Where this one has got just a, a flathead machine screw and a little rubber washer. And that's supposed to be uh, keeping that from spinning. And boy, it's just spinning like crazy. All right, please do not consider that an endorsement of this product. <laughs> but uh, maybe if we pull up on that a little bit, we can get it to get to, get, to tighten. No, it doesn't want to tighten at all. Don't buy the knockoff. Get the original from Shopsmith, all right? And then one last one to show you. What the heck is this? Well, you can see it's a Shopsmith featherboard, but it's mounted on this metal plate that has bolts, and it has these what Shopsmith calls T-nuts. And these are designed to fit into the Shopsmith miter slot like so. But why in the world would you want to do that? I mean, look at that. That's, that's as close or far away as I can get from my blade. Uh, that's because this was designed for use on Shopsmith's Sawsmith table saw, the, the Sawsmith 2000 table saw. The miter slots on that were further away from the blade than the standard Shopsmith dimension. And so to make that featherboard function with that, they designed that little base bracket um, you don't need that unless you have a Sawsmith 2000. All right, so that's about it for this video, I think. Uh, safety, safety kit, it's worth using. Uh, it's worth using right. And then I'm going to have to show you how I rip small pieces, like making roll top or tambour. It's kind of a neat trick, but that's for another video. All right, make it a great day.